Yeah, thanks, Peter. And uh, particularly thanks to the three uh, people who I've cajoled into doing the talk. So uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's always nice to hear from people who are actually doing, uh, growing them on a broad acre because they have unique experiences and, and insights into uh, why they do things. So I'm not going to introduce them because that's part of what they're doing is introducing themselves. But just to let you know, particularly anyone uh, perhaps on the Zoom, if you're still there, um, where people are coming from. So we've got Rod Birch uh, farming up at Karoo, going to talk first, and then we'll have a smooth transition into Ben Webb from Kojanup, and then we'll head east to near Beaumont, Mount Nay, uh, Field Longmire. So those are the three farms we've got. And so I'll uh, invite Rod to come up and uh, we'll get you going. OK, hello, everybody. Um, as Mark just introduced me, my name's Rod Birch. I own a farming business at Karoo called Catalina Farms. And um, I've been farming there for quite a while. As you can tell, I'm close to one of the oldest in the room. So anyway, um, first of all, I just want to indulge just for a moment and just say um, some thank yous, and that is usually do this at the end, but I don't want to forget it. And that is um, to Giwa. Um, I've been involved with Giwa right from the time there were a few, few of us um, hatched it out of the test tube, and I think it's just been an amazing organisation. And I particularly want to say today, um, congratulations to the four Giwa staff that are here, in Peter, um, Mila, Rachel and Ian. I think it's exceptional the work you guys do, bringing the industry together, the grains industry. And um, you've had many successful events. I've been to before canola forums and lupin forums before, oat, barley, other events, the research updates and that. So for those those few of you in the room that may not um, see what Giway do, um, I'm just going to give a big shout out and say congratulations. But And also I want to, um, so I don't forget at the end, to mention the support that this um, forum has had from Deep Herd, um, Kerry, you and your, your um, crew, and also UWA, I think it's been um, exceptional and I think you'd agree this venue is um, really good. It's one that I get to a bit because I sit on the board at the Institute of Ag, UWA, and um, I, think it's, I think it's exceptional, all the work that's done by those organisations and other, and other supporters, so that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to also just mention pretty much in line with that, the lunch I thought was exceptional and it's a wonder the whole of Perth didn't stampede the lunch because I thought it was fantastic um, pulse based lunch and I'm sure you'd all agree. Only nearly to be outdone by the um, chocolate fudge cookie at afternoon tea then, which actually a base product comes from Catalina Farms and um, but David has done so much work with the Loop and Co there and I'm involved with David and um, it's fantastic. So. Could I name and, name and shame anyone who didn't try that fudge? Chocolate fudge? No one didn't try? Oh, oh yeah, well, I was going to say, Sadiq. So everybody had, had a piece, that's fantastic, and Sadiq's already mentioned, and I think maybe one or two others, I was taking notes out there, or just casual observation. Some people went back and had a couple of lots, so just be careful tonight on the roads, because you know the, you've heard the promotion of lupins and the diet. And um, David mentioned that, so anyone who had two or even more, just exercise care, OK? <laughs> and then you'll be ready for more tomorrow, so that's good. Um, anyway, I'll just make a disclaimer. Uh, I must um, make a disclaimer right from the start, and that is um, I'm a cropping... Uh, my business has just been a cropping business for about 30 years straight. I haven't had livestock um, for all that time now, and I'm a plant... My passion is in plant science, so I'm a, um, I'm a passionate cropping person and only to take that to one higher level, I'm passionate about um, crop legumes. So this is a great spot for me to be. And I hardly ever add a lectern, so um, just bear with me. This will be fairly informal and, and casual. So um, with that, um, I think I've already just about mentioned that, I'm cropping only business. Um, one thing when I just put a few notes together pretty much last night to speak today was um, I realised I've been, I was looking back at some of my own history and um, I've been growing lupins from 1982 to 2022 this year without exception. I've never dropped them out. I know some people wander out of lupins and they say they're the cause of their problems or whatever and wander back in and what have you, but I've never ever missed a year of growing lupins. So that makes it 40 years, which um, 
which is incredible. And I thought, just, um, well, thank you, but I mean, I was, I was celebrating myself at that fact because I thought, surely, um, surely my youthful appearance belies the fact I've been growing lupins for 40 years. But, but most of you probably agree it doesn't. And, um, and even, I guess, at the sundowner tonight, I might have a small wine or whatever and just celebrate that fact. So it calls for a minor celebration. Cropping, um, I'm cropping, my business cropping about 13,000 hectares um, each year, and that's roughly the split. It depends a little bit on um, over recent years as we've been acquiring other farms and incorporating them. Um, some of them need repatriation. If they've had poor histories or whatever, it takes a while to turn the ship around. So, um, but that's basically my mix: 15%, canola 25%. I haven't just gone over board on the canola one and, and wheat about 60%. If I went back about 25 years ago, 30 years before um, canola came out, there was a stage there when I went out of livestock where I was actually growing for a few years there. Fifth, fifth, this, this will sound like a shocking statistic to you, but I was 50-50 wheat lupins. Some of you might remember that. John, you might remember. There were guys actually doing that. That's how much I love lupins. But in the northern sandplain system where I was farming, you saw on the map, um, and most of my starting point on farming was really good quality um, yellow sandplain soils, very highly suited to lupins. Um, it was just a it was just a magic um, rotation, and the herbicides all worked, and the weeds all died, and the rain was coming because it was before climate change came along, and it all it all just seemed to work. And then um, and then of course we had to address the reality of going on with that. And I might just say my farming business too is based on. Um, is based on, as a few of you know me, on a real modelling approach to farming. I don't jump at shadows, so we don't do um, things like um, if prices spike one year or whatever, we switch the whole farm around or whatever. We don't sort of jerk the thing around. We tend to work on a model that would be a minimum of three years and at least five years in terms of rotational um, stability and um, particularly the bottom line for me is commercial sustainability. So the farming business to remain strong, remain resilient, and to be able to survive into the future and experience growth is about um, having a real modelling approach. The fact that we're growing crops is just what we happen to do. And the other thing I might add too is the immense respect I have for the scientific research um, component of our industry because I think it gives us all the tools that we need to run successful farming businesses. and. Um, I'm just the guy that pulls those, um, all those elements into a toolbox and, and, and actually turns that into the applied science. So it just give me a little bit of the philosophy behind the business. So it's um, really something that I've, I'll keep, you know, will stick out. And, and most of you know how passionate I am with lupins and, and crop legumes because once we went out of livestock, we decided well, if we didn't have a pasture or livestock-based um, legume component, I would have to have a cropping legume and I'll never alter from that as long as my boots are still up at the farm. Um, obviously selective to soil type, so um, the, um, I was going to say, we've probably been more adventurous because I started off with mostly sandplain base and now I've gone to um, you know, a lot of medium soil types and even more recently, as some of you know, I've got a very historic farm that's been 120 years and never changed hands and we've taken that on. It's got some really solid, um, very solid heavy country and even last year I gave up in the first year we had it a, um, an area on the farm to research component and one of the, and there are a whole lot of different research projects going on there but one of them that I, they asked what if there's anything particular I want and I said yes I want a um, multi-species crop legume trial. So that was an interesting one. And I know Sadiq Wallace and a few others, Mark and those had um, come across and had a look at that last year. So it was really interesting because I'm excited about the prospect of perhaps um, for the first time in my life going towards growing chickpeas and lentils and faba beans, whatever it may be. So that's good. Um, so I'll just stick to, stick to the um, topic and I'm speaking on lupins, so lupins in my rotation are incredibly important. And probably um, I love following the, because I love the numbers, so I like following the, um, the modelling. And John, your presentation was um, a really interesting one, um, dealing with the, the economic analysis. 
And I think, um, like I said, we never drop lupins out. And also we use it, um, use them primarily to in a rotation, and our most profitable rotation is, and I start with lupins because I always treat legumes as they oil in the engine for our cropping rotation. So I say the lupins and everyone up there in the farm never argues with right about what lupins we put in, area of lupins, because we got oil in the engine. And everything else after that, whether it's wheat, canola, wheat, just takes from the system. And we have to apply everything that those crops need. Whereas the lupins is just an incredible source of nitrogen from the atmosphere and, and stored into the soil, together with off offering us some other incredible um, agronomic benefits. And in that rotation, most of the time, as I've got down there in the bottom line, is following lupins in rotation is the lime sand, um, which a lot of our soils need, particularly sand plain soils. Gypsum purely for the sulphur um, component, and then we'll follow it by deep ripping um, to give us partial incorporation of those elements and also um, those soils respond so well to it and allow those crops, as you've heard before, utilising that soil moisture and that's that's everything to us. So weeds and soil moisture are absolute um, not negotiable. So that's what we deal with. And it was an interesting point about legumes, um, that all the pulses leaving um, moisture in the soil or, you know, some maybe unrealised potential on the table. but. It doesn't overly worry me. We've got to grow what we've got and we and we try to maximise our water use efficiency of any crops we're growing. But if there's moisture left there, well, we know it's mostly available for next year and um, and we'll get that back similarly to un underutilised nutrients on perhaps years that have got a tight finish or whatever and if we've got good strong soils, those nutrients never seem to run away. They're, they're available um, for future crops. So just go back one. So I've only got a couple of slides, and one of them is just the pros of being a lupin grower, because I'm going to stick to that point. And as I've said, they're a great crop um, contributor in every form, particularly at the moment with the price of um, fertilisers and more particularly the price of nitrogen. The paddock disease break um, goes without speaking. I've, I've done that for 40 years straight. I know um, what a, a valuable um, break crop they are. And that would go for any other legume, but I'll stick the lupins. Different chemicals and modes of action, I think is um, is just everything for us. The war on weeds is is whether we'll, has always been a fact of whether we're there or not. And the farm, some of the farms we've taken over that have been, have lost, the, lost their way, I might just say, is mainly been from weeds have beaten them and they've gone down, but maybe it's just by we'll keep the pedal hard to the floor all the time and, and the fight war on weeds is um, everything to us. And so much input there, and, I'm, and I know I'm indulging here and acknowledging, but the work that Ari, formerly Wari, but Ari's done and that, and the weed smart approach and that on our farm is, is incredible. And that's why sort of back in that um, photo of me standing in the lupins and that, I don't quite get it that um, weeds are cause, uh, lupins are a cause of a lot of weeds on farms because I think um, they're an inc incredible contributor to dealing with weeds and the fact that we use completely different modes of action. They've been a bit slower coming along compared to maybe some of the other development and other crop types and the variations, but, um, but more particularly of late chemicals like reflex and even the other crops contribute to the benefit of lupins, I believe, because with the um, advent of um, Roundup Ready canola, um, I see it as a great contributor to our lupin crops. And you might wonder why, but it took away our dependence on chemicals like um, diflofenicin being involved in other crops, took away us using overuse of clethodum and leaving that purely for our lupin phase. So we always try and look at um, what these other crops of how they contribute and, and what the synergies are and what, they, what benefits they can attribute to the other crops that are growing in rotation. So it gives us a really complex uh, model and opportunity because some of the farms are actually run as almost different models because they've got so much different history. And it takes us, like I said, my strategy is about three to five years at least is almost short term. And it takes us that long to turn them around, and then we then we sort of get the ship on course, and away we go. The nitrogen one I want to mention because that's um, I've never seen it in my lifetime. Fertiliser last year paying 
$550 a tonne for urea and this year paying, you know, circa $1,300, $1,400 or whatever. That's the current price. We, we will try and price it um, when we think we, we can take advantage. But at the same time, um, in our measurements on soil end, um, I, I would say, and I know one or two people have questioned me on this, but sometimes we're a bit under and sometimes we're over about 50 kilograms of N available this year because we had tremendous lupin crops last year in big area and the amount of N that's contributed this year just from the atmosphere and being stored in the soil is is incredible. And then I always amortise when people look at, say, lupins and they go, oh, they're not worth, they're not price competitive with canola wheat or others in that year. But it, but it's a unique crop because I amortise the benefits of those crops and, they, and the lupin crop in the rotation has obviously amortised benefits going forward for another year, year two, and even year three. So with urea, I was out there at $1,300 a tonne um, and priced it per kilogram of N. Um, we're looking at, you know, circa $140, $150 hectare equivalent of N just stored in the soil that we haven't had to go and purchase. And um, more than that, I'll just say that the um, the lupin, the crops following lupins, particularly we always usually grow a wheat crop, very odd time canola crop, is always high yielding, always. It's a big claim, but I don't think I've hardly, I've ever seen a crop that doesn't is doesn't out yield one that hasn't followed lupins, um, to the usually to the tune of about maybe 400 kilos at the lowest through to one ton easily at the highest. So that's a pretty uh, good way of capturing extra value. And also the protein, which is a question, Alana, you asked earlier. Um, I'd just say that we would always work on 1% to 2% higher protein achievement. And that's a very, very important feature because often we'll see that as jumping it into um, from APW to AH or H2 or, or from H2 to H1 or whatever and capturing extra value there. So there's so many other like um, benefits that we'll pick up along the way from this very stable, slow release of organic form of nitrogen. And um, it's very hard to believe you can put on nitrogen this year to be available 12 months later in next year's crop and some of it a year after that or whatever. And if you look at synthetic forms of nitrogen, um, that's just not even um, dreamable. So um, I think that's about where we've got to with that. The other one I see with the lupins is the, um, the transition, which has been a... Um, been a passion of mine for a number of years now. I'm working with a few like-minded people, with David and others in the room, that um, now we're sort of collecting some momentum is to try and get lupins from the feed trough, the stock feed trough, into onto the table as a human food ingredient. And I believe that's the only way we're going to get any extra added value from that grain because when I've travelled around and been, you know, countries like South Korea or whatever, processing the lupins in the dairy industry, and that they have so many substitutional um, legumes that um, that lupins, it's just a price point. So if, they, if they'll if they take them when they're priced right, and if they're not priced right, they don't want them. But if we can get it into plant, the plant-based protein and that, and I must admit, I'm a, um, I, I enjoy a flexitarian diet, so I'm not vegetarian, vegan, whatever. I'm not a huge meat eater. and um, but. I think are very important. There's been some really uh, good points come up in some of the slides, and I'll just take licence in mentioning this. And Sadiq, you um, had one slide up there that pointed out the water use sufficiency of plant-based protein, and I think the world just needs to wake up to that, and we all know that, because there's only so much water available in the world every year. And when um, Ben mentioned about in the next 30 years going to be another 2 billion people um, on this planet to feed, and there's only the same amount of water, so where is that protein, where is that food going to come from? So it's just um, almost um, not debatable. It's just going to have to come from plant-based protein. So, and I think this is going to be where we come over the horizon as, um, as, as pulse legume um, producers. So um, I think that's about to cover that one. Let me know, Peter, if we're... Yep. Um, so... With that, I've got to say, I've got to temper some of my passion and just say that that's, um, and you can see us harvesting lupins there just last year. We, um, the headers are just running through lupin crop there. That was actually um, exceptionally good lupin crop. I think, Alan, you were probably in that chaser bin at the time driving that. 
think we caught you with the drone. But um, anyway, the um, have I jumped? I'm not sure if I've jumped to. Um, oh no, that's right. So with the um, with the lupin crop, the with the lupins, as I said, from feed to food, I think it's going to be a a, a um, para, real change in paradigm for in terms of price discovery because the pricing hasn't moved much. And I know John's left John Orr, but he had a slide up there showing the the values and the volatility in all the pulse grains. But lupins was almost just static, and. Um, that's because the feed market is so highly substitutional that um, that lupins haven't really haven't moved much. So I think the only at, only way that we can see value added there is just by getting it into that plant-based protein. The um, mostly our lupins are traded from the farm. I rarely ever put them into the system. We've got quite a lot of storage on different different farms, and you'll see a bit of it there, some of it there. So um, I try to. I've been doing this for a very long time. Keep the lupins there. And that came up in one of the presentations too about um, the pricing often not being at the right point. I think John made that um, mention of that. So we've seen that happen over the years and there's some years where the price is, um, so we don't like to be selling into a low price market. So if we can store them and carry through and then um, pick, pick when we think the market's stronger. The um, contraction of livestock numbers, the livestock industry and, and the processing of livestock um, issues with that have meant that the demand for um, lupins has, has dropped away, so that hasn't supported price. Um, I think another one of the um, actually I should be on the on the cons. There we go. It's better. The um, one of the other issues that I think with lupins has been the the maybe compared to I'm just thinking compared to the other grains that we're growing, which has been phenomenal development, say in canola, where we're, 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 we're given the choice of about three to five, or if not eight, new varieties every year, and um, and similarly with wheat, um, very very little um, varietal improvement over the time. But there's a very good reason for that, and the fact that the lupin um, genetic um, pool is so is so narrow, being mostly a Western Australian developed grain, and I know the lupin breeding program quite well. In fact, I enjoy having the um, trials on my farm every year um, with AGT, and that is um, just trying to introduce new um, traits and new novel, and particularly now having to um, view that map with the um, fact that moving from feed industry to the food industry, so the alkaloid levels and that which are um, very important to us in terms of um, keeping pests out of our crop but just trying to tread that fine line and how, how we deal with that. Um, so I think um, the future for lupins is in that varietal development almost more than any other um, element. If I could just um, mention also, I think um, I think a lot of the um, a lot of our agricultural benefits have come from, or well, in the last couple of years, or profile of agriculture is almost somewhat related to um, the COVID, because the because um, I think COVID has actually demonstrated to the consumer that you know the supermarkets aren't actually going to run out of food in Australia and around the world. So I think um, one of the as tragic as um, COVID has been. It's actually given our industry, it's elevated our industry, the profile in terms of people appreciating the food um, security and safety. Um, I think I will, you've seen a few other points there I've put on lupins, you know, disease resistant herbicide package, shattering alkaloid levels, so on. That's been pretty well spoken about, I realise, so I don't want to really repeat a lot of that. Um, but I'd, I want to use this opportunity to mention also that um, as a farmer who's been in the industry for a long, long time and intends um, staying in the industry, is I really want to just say thank you. I've got the opportunity, and I know there's people um, actually online on Zoom as well, and um, would like them to um, pick up on this point too. From my point of view, in developing a strong farming business and that, as I said, it's just made up of so many elements. And I actually want to just um, say thank you to all the contributors 
to our lupin and pulse industry in particular and the success that you people have provided for us in the past in maybe my 40 year journey with lupins and other crops and also um, wish you every success in, in going forward because each part of the industry, wherever you fit in, in um, the industry, whether it's in the research, crop breeding, extension, agronomy, product support, product supply, market development, and that is just so important. So, um, and I just think, I just sit in one part of it where we just try and pull all this together and, and, um, and turn it, turn and make magic happen when we get, when we get the amount of moisture. So we're all um, doing a good job, I believe, but I think we can do a lot more, so much more. And David, you highlighted that, and I just would mention this too, and it might sound unusual as a farmer to say this, but I think in terms of, say, if I'm sticking with the lupin story, the agronomy and that that we've got for um, growing lupins is actually very, very strong. I think a lot of it's been done, and I know just fine tuning and tweaking and tightening the wheel nuts and that, and I think um, it's going along really well. And I would actually challenge that we do take or some of the focus onto the market development and making, getting involved at a very high level of um, plant-based protein consumption around the world. And that we can, we know how to grow the things. In fact, we put them in the ground and we can hardly stop them. You know, they'll grow on concrete almost. So um, I think we've got that sorted. So I'd really challenge that. And Steve, in your, just to wrap up, Steve and I'm not sure if Lana's going to be joining us at that, for that final session, but is to actually, I think we've talked the talk and talked the talk and talked the talk, and I think it's come now to walk the walk. And I think, as I said right at the start, Giwa putting this forum together has been absolutely excellent, and I've had a really, it's been very, very enjoyable. All the presentations have been, have been immensely um, well researched and and been a great summary of where we're up to, but I think now this is this should we could make this the turning point where we just turn, try and turn the ship around and focus on how do we get this out there um, from such a small percentage of consumption. We don't have to try and explain it in Asia; they get it, um, but we we're producing it. So how do we um, how do we just turn that around? So I'm going to just say thank you very much for listening to me, and let's do it. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Um, good afternoon all, I'm Ben Webb from Kajanup. We farm in the high rainfall zone. We get about 535 mils a year. Um, at home with my wife and three kids, which some of them were here before. Uh, I came back to the farm 16 years ago after spending about seven or eight years uni and travelling around and working with the egg department. Uh, I came home to a traditional sheep farm, which was sort of the, in the area, a lot of weathers, a lot of, a lot of merino sheep. Uh, we re I was pretty keen on cropping, so we re-fenced the farm and focused cropping on the uh, higher gravel hills, the better, the more fertile, free draining country, and the wetter, rocky, sandy stuff we run sheep, merino sheep. Um, we used to use pasture for a legume, but we found there was always a compromise between stocking rate and the weeds. We'd try and spray the weeds out of the pasture, the silver grass, rye grass, cake weed, but then we couldn't run any sheep. So we've sort of, sh we've always, we always had grown lupins, but we sort of started to focus a bit more on that strongly. Um, our general rotation is canola, barley, lupins, wheat. We tried growing wheat on the lupins or the faba bean stubbles, but we found we were getting affected by frost for some reason. We'd grow these magnificent looking crops and then just got hammered by the frost. So we've been going barley and then wheat on the canola. I was cutting back the nitrogen following lupins, but I think that was a mistake in our area because there's more potential after the lupins with diseases, root diseases and all that sort of stuff. We needed to apply a similar amount of nitrogen to um, maximise sort of maximise the benefits of the, of the lupins. Um, in about 2014, weeds became a bit of an issue. We had some canola, I sprayed it with Select. Then the ryegrass didn't die, so we sprayed it again and it still didn't die. So our agronomist at the time, Kent Stone, sent some samples off over east to get tested and it came back as resistant to select. So after a few sleepless nights, I, um, we decided to go for a chaff cart, which I thought would suit our sheep enterprise as much as our cropping. About 60% crop, 40% sheep. 
Uh, and that worked really well for us. We also got the loop and agronomy became much better with metribuse and with the durian lupins, and we could use some pretty strong pre-emergence and then adding factor into the select, which was, you know, that would kill all of the ryegrass, and then again crop topping at the end of the year. Um, and then after a few more years, I sort of got a bit bored with the lupins, so we started playing around with a few things. There's one of our mixed species crops there, some lupins and vetches and clover, which I'll come to in a minute. So we thought we'd try, did a bit of research and thought, right, yeah, faber beans and vetches, these will be the go. Because we'd had a pretty strong liming program in the past, so the pH was at a stage where these, um, these crops would start to grow. So the first year we mixed, lupin, uh, mixed uh, vetches and beans together, and then they grew magnificently, and then they were a bit of a challenge to harvest. They all fell over, but we harvested them, separated the two, and then grew faber beans the next year as a standalone crop and then quickly learnt about chemical residues. That paddock had um, lontrul in the previous year, it was a barley or a, I can't remember now, stubble. And then the, the faber beans were a failure, they, they, didn't, they didn't grow at all. And we got Jeremy Lemon from the egg department came out, and we dug some holes and did a bit of research and it turned out that the lontrul from the previous year was not letting them inoculate. So then anyway, over the next few years we got a bit better at growing at growing the beans. Oh. There's meant to be a photo of some favour beans there. <laughs> anyway. Um, and they magnificent crop. They grow really well. They seem to tolerate the waterlogging a little bit better than the lupins, which I thought was good for our area. Uh, often does get too wet. Um, and we're getting some, yeah, some reasonable yields. The, the fungicide, spraying the fungicide was a bit of a challenge because when you needed to spray the fungicide, it was often too wet and you couldn't, you couldn't do it anyway. And broadleaves became a bit of an issue because the, the cake weed seemed to be um, getting on top of us. But we sort of managed that, managed that a bit. And then, so we'd grow those crops and then we had all these, these favour beans and we could, didn't have anything to do with them. So we, that have to sort of go up to Perth in March or in the off season. So, which was, we didn't have the storage or the scale to sort of set up for that, so we went back to lupins. Um, the vetches, still, we still grow vetches. Um, they can be a bit of a challenge with the, the hard seededness, even, I think they're timok, but they seem to keep coming back and they seem very hard to kill in the um, cereal phase. Um, so that's one of our, so in that, that photo there, there's lupins, vetches and clover and some cerradella, which you can't really see yet, but that does sort of pop up at the end of the year. And in th those, that might be over 25% of the legume. So we put the wiener lambs in there over summer while we're harvesting. When we're busy doing other stuff, focusing on the crop, we can put the lambs in there and they grow really well. And then we're not removing any of that nitrogen. It's sort of like putting them in the feedlot. So it's quite a simple way of um, getting, a, getting a benefit from the lupins without harvesting them. Now that's, that's, that's our farm there. So non, it's forest gravel predominantly, duplex. For, there's some, good, some pretty good country in there as well, but a lot of forest gravel, sandy, loamy stuff over clay at about three feet, two feet. So we were using SE14, which works really well to help get the um, crops to germinate. And it's especially good for the lupins because you can put the inoculant in there as well and then it stays wet and survives, survives well. So this year with Southern Dirt we decided to do a claying demonstration which not a lot has been done in our area, traditionally in the sandier stuff further east. So in that photo there we've got 500 tonnes of clay. We spread it out with the scraper and then ploughing it in to um, help alleviate the non-wetting. The ploughing has been working very well and you can tell the paddocks that we ploughed all the strips because the crops come up a lot more, a lot more evenly, especially the lupins and canola. Um, we're also, oh there it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's some nice looking faber beans getting a fungicide. Um, we're growing some winter wheat now. We're sort of new, a couple of years we've been, we've been trying it, but it's new to us. And these seem to do well on the legume stubbles. They seem to like that slow release sort of nitrogen. So these can go in early on the, on the wetter, wetter sort of country and we can avoid the frost. So that's last year, pre-grazing on the left and then we graze it for a month or so and then take the sheep out and then 
let it, let it go to flower. And that's been working well for us too so far. So yeah. <laughs> In our travels, which we uh, always include a, a bit of a side of ag, one of them we did the Pulse Conference into uh, India. And one thing we realised is they didn't really like Aussies at that time because we cleaned them up on the chickpea market. So they were a little bit tender when we got there. But they were pretty honest on how we saw the, the Pulse industry and... Um, we learned very quickly that it's just a, they want good quality, obviously, at the cheapest price available. So it probably got us all back to reality that we had to produce a good commodity. Um, and we were pretty much uh, at the mercy of the markets. And I was talking to Ben just before, and it makes you realise that, yep, Ben's stream is about value adding, but our goal is to make sure that we just keep producing cheap products at full steam, otherwise we won't survive the pulse. The pulse uh, structure is um, we've got to make it more profitable for people to be attracted to the industry. I don't think that's rocket science. And in a uh, couple of trips that we've done, and we got to the Ukraine, and I've always taken an interest while we've been travelling, um, is that they can grow them well. They had better availability to fungicides, which surprised me greatly to go to Ukraine and they were growing over four tonne of chickies and field peas and they were hammering and we hadn't even heard of the fungicides they were using. We were like, Phew. we always thought that that was just vodka and, uh, which they did have that, mind you. <laughs> um, so that was a bit of a reality check that there was countries out there that are really steaming along and they're getting their yields up very quickly. So we have to remain fairly competitive. And uh, when we were on a holiday, I actually snuck in a couple of days, told Binny it was a beautiful part of the world that we're going up to the police, but I didn't quite fill her in that we'd f we were going to a couple of growers. And they hit the same problems that we do. They were economically struggling with lentils because of the Midwest really pushing into the cheaper production. So they were looking for something to replace it with and they ended up growing, oh well they're kabulis but they call them garbanzo beans. And it was just the quick the quick moves that they they were adapting. So you know they're all it was still came back to economics. They were either in or they would go to just drop them out completely. So it was, it's probably a reality of how I look at, uh, at Pulse is that we have to make them an economic solution first and foremost. Um, obviously we farm on the south coast, we're sort of 425 to 450 mil rainfall. Um, we sort of run uh, Circle Valley loams which are sand over clay and they're, uh, they're a slight, it's a slightly sodic sand so we have issues when it comes to legumes. Uh, and then we shift across into red-grey loams, which are quite strong and probably more suited to the legumes. So we run quite a um, lot of different parts to our rotation of... Uh, probably our staple rotation is peas, wheat, canola, wheat, barley. And then we'll extend that to a six-year rotation on our sandier, sandier type soils. And on our heavier country, we probably think that we can squeeze in a sixth year with a second legume and maybe it'll be go back to lentils and or chickpeas depending on how which we're, we're having a go at this year. Um, we shifted to continuous cropping out of stock. We bought a property in 2008 and it was all stock and so to tidy it up we just whacked it into full crop and the economics showed very quickly that we should focus on continuous cropping, so we just sold the sheep and moved that way back then. Um, we struggle, and I've got a slide a little bit later, with the lentil situation that they can go from high production on our, or I wouldn't say high, but better production on our red loams to almost nothing on the sand, and Mark Seymour mentioned that earlier. And what we what we have to do is analyse it fairly quickly because we went from over a two tonne in our first year 
at 400 bucks or 420. We thought, oh shit, if we can get the price up, that'll be good. And the next year, as soon as it got onto the sand, it went nothing on the sand, which brought the average back to 0 0.7. So even though the price had gone up to 800, the economics were still, still quite poor. Um, the hardest bit, and we're lucky that we've got Mark in Esperance, is when we try and have a go at something, the resource window is small for pulses. We've got really good people here that are great with pulses, but if you are trying to get into the marketplace to see what, at, what is else, what we can change. Um, and I was talking to Mark earlier about varietal change. Varietal change will get us there in the end, but we've got to get there. We've got to do stuff today. We can't wait five years. So for, for us to motor, um, we need short-term solutions and Ben mentioned fungicides. Well, we're really pushing them just to beat this window because we need to be getting our production up today. Um, so in our, in our system, you know, uh, the positives are our wheat yield's really jumping and it's consistent and it's probably pushing our water use efficiency model really well. Uh, last year was a classic of our uh, we probably got about, it wasn't a wet year, but it was our best wheat average. And the legume, the wheat following the legume was about uh, 1.3 tonnes better than the wheat on canola. And we used our most nitrogen ever last year. So while we don't understand the mechanics of that, and I'm sure there's plenty of people here that have the skills to do that, um, all I care about is what's going to the bank account because head office, uh, she'll soon tell me if it's not happening. Um, and that really keeps us as a lower risk profile and that's really evident this year when we've got accelerated nitrogen costs, you know, this, it's about balancing our business. Um, and, that, and one of the questions and I was talking to Andy Barr in South Australia about it was, are we seeing, you know, I've always sort of believed that we should be growing smaller canolas, smaller wheats and smaller barleys and bigger legumes so that our total system of water use efficiency is improved over the circuit. Uh, not so much per year, but just in a total, like a, 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 a water balance over our full cycle. Um, obviously the weed management, management side, it, it mixes us up a bit, but there are challenges with legumes. You know, we, we uh, if it, obviously we suffer from water logging, so that's, that's a bit of an issue, so, you know, we continue to see, it's great to see these new chemical groups starting to help us along. Um, rotation sustainability is probably where, that's probably that feel good that we hope that's why legumes are there. Keeps us sustainable in the long term. The negatives at the moment is that canola's double the legume price and if you are really economic about it, it's, it's you've got to really think hard of why you're doing it. Um, because it does comp compromise your total farm profit. When you look at it uh, in the broad scale, I know we're having this jump, but there's been a big jump in our area of people have dropped it, which means the numbers move really quickly, which is not great for the industry. When, if we're going to have a sustainable industry, we've got to get that. Once it hits double, it changes all the economics pretty quickly. Um, the biggest gripe I have with legumes is harvestability. And I don't mean that the, they're that hard to harvest, it's just you machinery cost is accelerating at a huge rate. And I just love smashing up new headers. So you hit your legumes, looks really nice, your machinery, a week later it looks like World War Three, And it's, it's the one thing that if we can get our legumes up off the ground, make our harvestability a little bit easier, I think that's part of the puzzle. And that's a, that's a really, it's not really about legumes, it's just we don't need heaps of height, we just need to get it up a little bit. Um, I think the, the, the rest of the points have probably been well addressed today as in you know market accessibility and all that side of it. I think we're, we're lucky in Esperance, we've got a port, we've got containerising and I, but I do think storage is going to be one of the future issues that we're going to, you know, always continue. I mean, if we're going to stick with legumes, we're going to invest money because we're going to have to store them better. 
Um, goals for ourselves. Um, one thing we're in, uh, we did with the, the soil testing and we found that we're really bad for, oh, what's that, phenopinadella, which is a soil, soil ascochyta. Um, and if you look at uh, on the right, you can see that our levels uh, over here, we, we're at six, 650 in the soil and I think the acceptable level's 10. So that's pretty, not a fantastic thing to know. It's good to know it, but it's not fantastic to see it because we didn't know how to address it and I've tried to research as much as, as we could on it and obviously Pythium, which is, which is uh, in our soils. But the hardest bit is, is how to address uh, issues like this, which it calls, causes girdling around the bottom of our peas and, and legumes, so they tend to fall over at harvest time, which makes them harder to harvest. So we've been looking a lot at fungicides, you know, uh, in furrow fungicides, to see if we can improve our standability, which comes back to that harvestability, and probably will result in higher yields. But it's it's a hard path to get that um, to get that investment into our industry. I've really struggled, and I've done a lot of work with Mark, just trying to find products and try and get them over the line. And in that third line, I rang one of the uh, companies, and they were, they were very honest, which is great, and they were very direct in saying that we're a second tier industry, which means they wouldn't invest in bringing it. it was a it was a live bacillus from overseas and they said, oh, we just can't put the investment into your industry. So that was, that was a true reality of where our industry's at. So we realised that that wasn't, so we started to research other products that we could get into the country or were acceptable and we're trialling, and most of our trials are probably like a lot of farmers, they'll say do five hectares and you go and do a hundred just to make sure that you check it properly and then if that works next year you do it over the whole farm and that comes about because we don't have time I'm always a believer that we if we keep waiting and waiting we'll just never get there fast enough so we just got to have a go and if it doesn't work so be it wear the cost and move on so we're trialing a couple of these on broad scale this year that are I think we've got about 200 hectares in between two and Mark will test them all and we'll see how we uh, see if we can get a, a quick gain into our system. But, uh, and the other ones, uh, you know, obviously the top one of new varieties, that's happening. You know, you've got the right people here to do all of that. That's not our job. Our job is to just grow them. So I hope if that research keeps being invested into this industry, it's great. Um, chickpeas, um, we look forward to chickpeas because they go up in that price factor, which means more sustainability. So hopefully with a bit of uh, that chilling factor coming into them, we can grow them sustainably down our way. Um, frost is a bugger. We rarely talked about it 10 years ago, and now we talk about it. And legumes are a bit of a sucker for that. But anyway, that's, that doesn't mean we're, we're not throwing them, uh, throwing them out. It's just a consideration, so it's, it's important for research. Um, the picture down the bottom shows exactly what we're talking about with our soil types. We drew a line through the paddock where we thought we had sand and clay. And we we're obviously about 200 metres off that line and we got zero production of the lentils on the sand. And yet our peas were still, you know, 1.5 to 2 tonne plus on the sand. And it was literally a line of... So sensitivity to our legumes and learning our soil types fairly important. Um, so our goal, and we set ourselves a pretty fair target, is that we need to achieve a thousand bucks a hectare. If we can achieve a thousand bucks, it's sustainable in our program. If we fall away from a thousand, then we're probably at the mercy of going to the common canola type rotation. So it's like the lentils, when it fell to 400 bucks, we didn't achieve it. When we got smashed with that paddock, we didn't achieve it. So we're not saying we're getting there, but we've got to try and even out the bumps of pulses so that the, the income stream is consistent. Um, and I, and I'd, 
I'd like to thank PACE uh, being part of that over the years. It's great to live in an area where a lot of keen growers and a fairly strong industry is, is supporting us. Um, Giwa, for days like today, it's awesome. Uh, Mark, great to work with Mark and his efforts in making our industry better are fantastic. And everyone today, it's, um, this is what it's all about. Uh, questions, uh, ask any questions, make any comments. So uh, to any of the, uh, the farmers, uh, or indeed amongst themselves, um, uh, I invite you to, to, to ask any uh, questions and we'll start with David here. Thank you, David. presentation. Uh, PACE has been around a long time. Um, your target of $1,000 per hectare at one tonne per hectare equates to about a dollar a kilo return. So my numbers around um, value adding, I wonder what, it's, what, what has it been that's held, sorry, what is it that's held PACE back in years gone by of not stopping at containerising product and actually pushing into more sophisticated foods. What's held you back? Um, f firstly, the tonne of the hectare is not enough. So we can't average a tonne of the hectare. That's got to, ch it, it is changing, um, but it's got to change quicker. So we'll, we'll probably have to pump that one first. Um, I would say that in a region where it's a fairly big region that that can it all comes back to your system approach it, it trials uh, can't go fast enough for people to and, and Mark and I were talking about this earlier it's like chickpeas if you have to say so them six weeks later most of our systems just don't allow that time or we don't have the consideration for that. It's do what we do in a five, four to five week window, pack everything in the shed and that's your year and away you go. So if we're gonna chase down lines where we have to be flexible in our timings, that's probably number one. So most growers, and I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm only speaking for how we see it, uh, that you're looking at how you can fit it into being an economic farm because the minute you put it into smaller, if you have to bend anything, and most of Mark's work will fit our systems fairly quickly. I might just explain that a little bit better. Um, I think what has stopped PACE from investing in downstream processing closer to the human food market? That's my question. Oh, I think Mark's probably yeah. the man. Probably. Um I think most people know that Neil Wandle, uh, the ex-CBH chairman, is based out of Esperance and he has a cleaning plant and exports a lot of stuff out of containers and it's certainly a consideration that he's been had people talk to him about. don't think he makes any secret about that. He's probably at the wrong end of his career to go that way. So it's probably that's one thing. I, to be honest with you, um, I think we need to bring the farmers into the equation with the protein extraction and and so on. I think they need to be probably partners in the whole process, like Rod, Rod is part of the Lupin one. But I think, to me, we've got a lot of pretty well off farmers in Esperance. Uh, and we haven't really had too many people come and say, look, we'll work with you and you can be partners in it and you'll get a, pay, you'll get a part of that $32 a kilo. Because I think, let's, let's go back to beans, favour beans. There is no end of people that will grow favour beans in our area and in the south of the state, but they're so uncertain about the price and being able to sell it. And, and if we could just get our act together and match people who want to run those plants with investment from farmers as well as other organisations and get them in there so that we can just... You've got the farmers in there, they're part of it. They're more likely to lock in to grow it because they know they've got somewhere to go and they're also going to capture some of that value. We just have that separation. Uh, I, I think we're always going to be a step behind. So uh, 
more than happy to organise people to come and talk to PACE about getting that, that happening. Because um, I think it's a logical place to do it. If it's not, if it's not pulse, if it's not favourite beans, it's going to be peas. It's going to be lentils. It's going to be lupins. It's, we can grow everything down there. It's just um, we need a, a, you know, someone with more a business sense than I have to uh, get these things happening. Wallace. Thank you. Um, this is a question to each of the farmers and. Um, I would like to know if the doubling in the price of nitrogen has altered your decision about the percentage area you put into grain legumes. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with that, Wallace. Um, as, I, or, as I explained, I'm a committed legume grower and never drop it out, so I don't jump at shadows. I will, will grow lupins all the time. Last year we still had a very what would be fairly high percentage, higher than what I put up, higher than bigger area than what we've got this year. And then with the rising price of nitrogen, we're riding that one now and it's um it's a it's fantastic. I don't I think um is the is the graphs was a John that had up there just showed that um with the rising price of nitrogen the um benefit of, of having that in the cropping rotation is incredible. And um I just see it as such a stable form we run on a a plan that or a model that three years is probably the very short term, you know, three to five years is even short term. So we don't tend to jump around. We tend to um, keep things um, fairly even there. So it's not the only signal that we um, that we react to. Uh, yeah, not yet. No, not chasing rainbows, but we'll probably be a bit more careful with the uh, nitrogen that we do apply. Uh, no, I, I think the, that's why we're here, is we're probably convinced that it's part of the rotation. I think the economics will swing when the prices come back and that's when I'm hoping we see the true benefit of our system, when we see an inverse reaction to the market where we've got higher inputs and we have this residual from doing our system. Adam Bott. Here and then there. Sorry. Thank you. I, I just uh, want to add on to the point which David Feinberg mentioned. One of the problem is uh, uh, there's not enough uh, commodity there, even when we think about the value adding. Uh, Mark, you may remember, we, we arranged uh, one of the largest traders from Mumbai who came all the way from Mumbai and he looked at your field piece uh, all around Esperance when we established the pace. He said, I'll buy all those peas. At that time, we, all, we had only 6,000 tons. And then we worked with the Australian wheat board and arranged wheat shipped and so on. So the, the whole problem is that, uh, look, uh, John Orr is not here. We thought we we're going to have sufficient pulses, peas and chickpeas and lentils splitting so that we can have the commodity value added, etc. So this is one of the problems. And the eastern coast in Hosham and also in parts of Queensland, number of Indian traders came from India, established splitting and processing plants, and now we see in the supermarket Australian product packed in 250 gram, 500 gram, etc. So we don't really have the commodity. The last point is that the price we just have to look at the long-term average. These 1,000 and 1,200 are aberrations, and you need to look at what will be the long-term average for peace uh, and, and also the pulses. Otherwise, you will not be in a business. You can't sh uh, chase the shadows, as, you, as Rod mentioned. Question there. Uh, I'm Nanti Boran from University of Western Australia. It's fantastic to listen to the practical farmers. Uh, my question is to Rod. Uh, I've been thinking you are a professor. Uh, you, should, uh, you should have been a professor. Um, <laughs> my question is um, myself and Ken Flower has been thinking of putting a proposal for Western Australian agricultural collaboration. 
on why farmers are not adapting to legumes. What are the barriers in your experience? What is the main reason farmers are not going for legumes? I've been talking to Glenn here, and Glenn has been telling me that Western Australia soil may not be the suitable one. From your experience, what is the main barrier farmers are not going for legumes? Mm, that's a good question. And um, first of all, I think it'd be remiss of me not just to say welcome to the minister who's just come in, Mr. Uh, McTiernan. So, um, and your first point about being professor, um, the only attractive part about that, I think they do actually have a retirement age, and I, I might reach that, whereas at the moment there, there's no, um, there's nothing there. Uh, so the, I think the barriers um, to growers doing their legumes are either some of them are very calculating and, and um, run um, progressive businesses and will do those um, and, and do that modelling and work out the benefits, you know, the benefit um, cost analysis and that. But I think um, in a general sense, um, I think it is actually the work of industry and those people that are um, really good with doing that analytical, you know, economic analysis to be doing that and presenting that case to us because because by and large, mostly getting on with running the business or whatever, it's something I'm intently interested in, but in, in developing that case, like what is the compelling case to having legumes in the system? What are the, um, what are the, where's the elasticity in terms of how it relates to nitrogen prices and where, where the other commodity prices are in the cycles, so on and so forth, like um, rotational sustainability, you know, how, how much do you jump at shadows and you don't jump at shadows. So, yeah, they'd be some of the points. But I think there, I think there'd be some very um, highly skilled people out there that can do that analysis, and I'd love to see, see the findings. Any further questions? Are you talking whole farm analysis? So are you talking whole farm analysis, really, where, you know, uh, rather than just... Your, your, your normal gross margin for your two or three year sequence, you know, try and incorporate the um, looking at your farm, um, 13,000 hectares, and saying, okay, this is what I'm growing, you know, at 20% uh, lupins, whatever, or if I if I move to with this soil type, I'll have 10% of the soil I could go to chickpea, and and kind of uh, use your tractor, your machinery type, and go to that that extreme where you can actually look at a whole farm with your, your equipment and then, you know, that, that kind of analysis, is that what you're after? You may be blowing it out a little bit bigger there, but because the, que the original question was just about the, the legume component mm. and the importance of the legume component and how do you get a good handle on the, um, the sustainability and the um, return of that being in the program. And that's how I took it. And um, I think your colleague, is it John, actually presented some slides on that, you know, long-term rotations and when you put a legume in, and how it related, and, and that's the thing. I, I was really excited by those slides. It's the sort of um, work that I'd like to see, but I think you know there are people that are in that sort of agriculture economic analysis that can do that work and that number crunching, and, and that's the sort of detail I really enjoy seeing. But that's the type of work you need uh, incorporating with growers using their machinery, their numbers. This isn't something which comes out of you know um, a, a typical research uh, handbook and, and having having you know direct feedback and direct consultation with growers is is vital for that to happen yes Absolutely. I agree it's almost a business by business proposition because wherever you if you choose if you chose to do that nationally obviously there's just so many different um so much variance around Australia and then you get to soil types and you get to the maturity of the business and what's what are the key drivers for the business and what are the what are their financial obligations and complications and what have you so it's a very dynamic be a very dynamic model but it, that you could simplify that and come back down like the slides that um that john put up didn't refer to any particular farm or instance but people can um mm. people can tweak that and take out of what they know what they want final question from joe wheeler from GRDC. hi this one's for all three growers up there um, we've heard today about WA soils not being the best for growing some pulse varieties. So how does your um, soil amelioration or the addition of other ameliorants 
change your view on the pulse species within your rotations that you might be able to grow? Um, I'm happy to go first with that one, Joe. Um, as you know, because I farm in the northern ag region and that's been with the saw types that are particularly suitable for lupins and that's been the lupin hub or whatever and I've got some of those saws that are particularly suitable for lupins. It's a no-brainer. We don't look at anything else because most of the other pulses um, demand something. Um, they demand um, different saw types. But I've, but I've taken some of those on as well. So I can see it'll be a um, mix and match. You know, it'll be horses for courses and and we'll just match them. But I have got a belief that across the whole state, if you go from right out at um, Conning up in the east, right through to Agin or Benue in the north and everywhere in between, that the diversity in the whole Pulse um, family is just so immense that um, we've seen today that there's probably a Pulse for everybody and maybe one, two or three Pulses per farm you know, and just a matter of matching um, you know, the adaptation. So I, I think there's something there for everyone. I think that's what's so exciting about it. Um, when it was put up, just I just my last comment was put up that canola is the adaptation was has been so widely suitable for most saw types, but in the pulses it's the different pulse families, and I think we can match them. And even just like um, if you swing away from the cropping to the livestock, there's so many clovers, ceridellas, and other medics and and legume pastures that surely there's just about a medic. Uh, just about a, a legume, whether it's pasture legumes or cropping legumes, that's suitable for just about every m square metre of soil type in that region in WA. Ben? Yeah, no, I agree with all that. And also that liming as well, I think that has helped a lot, growing, getting rid of those lower pH areas. Phil? Yeah, uh, I think that's why. Yeah, so we're, we're a bit the same. We run from clay amelioration to variable rate lime and gypsum t with a goal to try and level level it out so that we can adapt those varieties to what we can grow and fit them within that. It all comes back to that window. If we can fit them within that window and we can ameliorate around that, then we're on a winner. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join with me in thanking our three growers and Mark Seymour. <laughs>